Hello, and welcome to the latest monthly meeting of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. I'm Kevin Kosar of the R Street Institute. And I co-founded this group with Lee Drutman of New America back in spring of 2016. We created the Ledge Branch Group to contend with the widespread perception that Congress is dysfunctional. And the group's objectives are twofold and straightforward. First, we want to create an enduring transpartisan space to assess the capacity of Congress to perform its constitutional duties and to meet the demands of the public. And second, we want to collaborate on ideas for improving the legislative branch's performance in our separation of power system. The way we view uh, legislative branch reform is that this is not a partisan issue. It's not something where there are left-right talking points on it. Mostly, it's an institutional issue, and it's something where folks from across the aisle can easily come together and work on issues small and large and make the system a bit better for all of us. Now, today's meeting is on a very important topic, money and the House of Representatives. And we are honored to have two terrific speakers today, Steve Israel and Zach Womp. Both are former members of Congress and both know an awful lot about being a legislator and the burdens of fundraising. Their careers are long and august, so in the interest of time, let me keep my introductions of them brief and high level. Steve Israel heads the nonpartisan Cornell University Institute of Politics and Global Affairs in New York City. He was a Democratic member of Congress from 2001 to 2017, representing the second and third districts of New York. He served as House Democrats' chief political strategist between 2011 and 2015 as chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Our second speaker, Zach Womp, is the co-chair of Issue One's Reformers Caucus, a bipartisan group of more than 200 former members of Congress, governors, and cabinet officials that advocate solutions to fix our broken political system. He represented Tennessee's third district from 1995 to 2011 and served on the mighty House Appropriations Committee. Now, the structure for today's one hour program is simple. First, we're gonna ask Steve to share his expertise for about 10 minutes on how does fundraising in the house work? What are you supposed to do? Who's in charge of it? And who sets the goals of the system? Then we'll toggle over and ask Zach to spend about 10 minutes to talk about the problems with this system. Where are the pathologies? Where are the friction points? After that, we'll have a dialogue with Steve and Zach, each talking for five minutes about ways to reform the system. And then for the remainder of the program, we're going to open it up for Q&A from you all. So having said that, let me turn it over to former representative Steve Israel, so he can tell us about how the House fundraising system works or doesn't. Or doesn't work. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, thanks for the invitation to participate with you today. I'm honored to do it. I'm especially honored to be with my old friend and brother, Zach Womp. Um, your viewers may see something unusual uh, today, and that is in a, in a polarized political uh, and partisan environment, they're going to see a, a Republican and a Democrat agree on stuff. And I think we need more of that in, in the country. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, I served as chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Uh, I served uh, in total 16 years in the House of Representatives. Uh, I left uh, undefeated and unindicted, which is a triumph these days for members of Congress. Uh, and uh, I also served with Zach on the Appropriations Committee. He and I served together uh, on the Appropriations Energy and Water Subcommittee, and it really was a pleasure to, to work with him on our national labs, our energy policy, and environmental issues. Uh, I want to, um, I think the best way to talk about how fundraising works or doesn't work uh, is uh, for me to share, uh, take you inside that process and share some actual experiences that I went through. Uh, I was uh, elected in uh, 2000. Uh, I was elected to a very Republican district that was uh, represented by former Republican Congressman Rick Lazio. Rick left the House in order to run for the Senate against Hillary Clinton. Uh, and um, I, I, I was elected, went to Washington. Um, I'm a history buff. And so I was so caught up by the, you know, the, the, the things that I saw, the icons, the ceremony, and I just couldn't wait to dig into freshman orientation and, and hear the wisdom uh, of, of our leaders, both Democrats and Republicans, and this extraordinary enterprise called the United States Congress. 
And one of the first things I heard uh, was a gathering of uh, all the newly elected Democrats that year. That year, there were only 14 of us, included Adam Schiff and myself, and Betty McCollum and, uh, and others. And uh, a senior Democrat came in and here we are, our eyes just wide open, absorbing it all. And that Democrat began the conversation with these words. Congratulations on your election to Congress last week. How much have you raised since then? And we just started giggling. You know, we thought it was just an icebreaker. And uh, that leader then said, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that this is not a joke. If you represent a competitive, high-priced media market, you need to raise $10,000 a week every week between now and your next election, or else you're not getting reelected. And that was a very sobering moment for me. Now, fast forward several years, I became the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, chosen by Nancy Pelosi uh, to lead our efforts uh, to elect Democrats around the country. And I had the, un en the unenviable task of taking uh, our recruits, our candidates for Congress, uh, who wanted so strongly to perform public service and fix what was broken in Washington and take them to a small balcony outside my office overlooking a power plant in, I guess it would have been Southeast Washington, and sit on that balcony and say to them, congratulations on your candidacy. How much are you raising each week? And if the answer wasn't $30,000 a week by the time I became chair of, D of DCCC, which was 2011 through 15, if the answer wasn't $30,000 a week, I would have to say to them, I don't think you're gonna make it. I don't think you can get elected. When I came to Congress, and Zach will share his own experiences, you had to put in 10 hours a week of call time. When I left Congress, you had to put in 30 hours a week of call time if you were in a competitive race in a high priced media market. So I don't wanna overstate the case. Most members of Congress were not putting in that time, but those in high priced media markets where the price per point is you know, $750 to, uh, you know, to $1,500, and you had a real race, it was 30 hours. When I left Congress, I wrote a piece for the New York Times called Confessions of a Congressman, an op-ed. And in that piece, I actually quantified the number of hours uh, that I spent fundraising uh, in my 16 years. Exclusive of the time that I spent raising money for DCCC as its chairman, just for my own races in a high-priced media market where every race was competitive, uh, I spent, I raised $20 million over 16 years for my own races, put in 4,200 hours of call time, uh, and went to 1,600 events just for myself, 1,600 fundraisers just for myself. I calculated also that I probably gained 12 pounds by eating close to 2,000 soggy egg rolls uh, at, uh, you know, at those restaurants uh, around Capitol Hill. I want to share one other story with you before we go to Zach that illustrates how impactful this can be on a, a national level. I wrote about this in my New York Times piece. One morning, uh, I woke up in my congressional district uh, on Long Island uh, and raced to Kennedy Airport to catch a flight for, to California, where I was going to be supporting and stumping for and speaking for a variety of Democrats in tough races in California. Uh, the sun was just rising over Long Island, and it must have been about 6 a.m. I was in the car, and my cell phone rang, and it was the director of the Democrat Congressional Campaign Committee. And she told me that uh, the Republicans had dumped about $2 million overnight to try and defeat a congressman who's still there, Ami Berra. Uh, so they just put two, they bought $2 million of time overnight to, to defeat Ami Berra. And she said, we got to find another $2 million in order to, to hit parity with them or else he, he could lose. Uh, I said, Kelly, solve the problem, figure out, figure out where the $2 million is going to come from. Let me know when I land what, we're gonna, what your recommendation is. Well, the only thing you can do in those instances, and it's the worst task imaginable for the Republican chair of the NRCC or the Democratic chair of DCCC, you gotta pull it from another race at that point. So we pulled $2 million from a candidate who now was just abandoned, just wasn't going to win because his race wasn't funded, moved it to an incumbent uh, to protect the incumbent. I landed at Los Angeles, went to the hotel, uh, the director called me and she said, Mr. Chairman, we have a problem. And I said, now what? She said, well, the Republicans just dumped $2 million against Ami Berra. I said, no, no, we did this already. 
They dumped it. We, you, we had this conversation. Don't you remember? We spoke about this this morning. And she said, the director said, oh, no, Mr. Chairman, as soon as we reach parity with them, with our two million, they put in another two million. And now we got to figure out where we're going to get another two million. Folks, that is not functional. If you're spending your time trying to figure out like a shell game, right? Finding money here, losing money there. That's not what our founders had in mind. And if you're spending 30 hours a week on call time raising money, the real problem there is it just becomes an opportunity cost. That 30 hours is not being spent trying to figure out how to bring the nation back, uh, what to do about the challenges in the, our, our economy, how to rebuild the middle class, working families, how to make government more efficient. You're not talking and thinking about the issues that people elected you to govern on. You're thinking about how you can get reelected. I do not know a single member of Congress on either side of the aisle who likes this system, who enjoys the call time. I'm surprised that it hasn't been reformed up to now, uh, to, up to this point. Now, I know we're going to talk about those reforms. I am fundamentally optimistic because we have people like Zach Wamp and Issue One uh, who are really dedicating themselves to improving this, uh, to uh, talking about reform, raising the discourse, and getting smart people to think more about how to fix a system uh, that the American public knows is broken. So thanks a lot again for having me on, and I'm especially interested to hear what uh, my former colleague Zach Wamp has to say. You're a tough act to follow, but thank you. I, I want to kind of tip my hat to R Street and Kevin Kozar. Um, I tell young people all the time that information is power. And so you should find good sources of information and saturate yourself in it. And every morning, I still, to this very day, we used to have, Steve, when we were in Congress, clips that were handed to us. Now, electronically, you can go and get your clips. And I, I pull about eight sources every morning, and R Street's one of them. I just want to say that. I think you're doing really good work, and it's really important. And it keeps us connected with great information and great research. And uh, Bill Gray, I want to send a shout out to your communications guy because he used to be over at issue one with us and our loss was your gain. And then uh, to Antonia, uh, she just got her uh, U.S. citizenship. And so she's on this call as well. So congratulations to her. Steve Israel, it's always an honor uh, to be with you. You and I have done this in Boston and New York in public events before COVID. And now we're doing it with the new way of communication. And so it's an honor always to be with you. I always say that former members have the uh, luxury of telling the inconvenient truth. And that's why the Reformers Caucus of Issue won 200 former members. Uh, we speak with some authority. Some people say, well, you're former members, it doesn't matter. But th we, have, we have the ability to say things that need to be said that aren't popular. Current members have this dilemma. What can I get away with in my party or the other party uh, without losing my seat? And I mean, they're motivated by kind of number one, holding their seat, which brings us to this dilemma. I like the way Steve set his history up. So I'm going to set mine up because in the last 30 years, this has changed. This fundraising problem has changed dramatically. I ran first against a 18 year incumbent, really honorable lady. She's now gone from this earth. Uh, and I was at her funeral and I ran against her and the, the, one of the reasons I ran was not because um, I didn't think she was honest. Uh, I ran because she ultimately took over 60% of her money from political action committees. And at that time, PACs were about the only outside influence beyond individual contributions. And the fundraising chase was not near as egregious or onerous as it is now. But she had kind of grown through the 18 years, more and more a creature of Washington, taking more political action committee money than individual contributions back home. And I talked a lot about that. And so I didn't beat her. I came real close, but then she did not run for reelection and I won an open seat and became part of the class of 94, the Gingrich class, the Repub first Republican class in 40 years. Very similar to Steve, it didn't take us long to realize that the two parties sort of separate you at birth, you know, once you're there and it's us and them and everything is geared around this competition between the two parties, <clears throat> encouraging you not to work with the other party, number one, but number two, no, get, make sure you spend that time raising money. Um, one thing Steve didn't go a lot into that I want to go into is this process called dialing for dollars because real early on, and, and this was, 
Um, I don't know if it started with Gingrich, but it was clearly part of our early organization. And then both parties proliferated it almost like a nuclear proliferation um, where you would advance in the conference or the caucus based on how much you were willing to raise money. And the dialing for dollars concept caused members to be organized such that you know, even your chief of staff who controlled your time while Congress was in session would be very keenly aware of your time commitments to go across the street to the R NRCC or the DCCC and dial for dollars. And what really aggravated me about that requirement is I advanced on appropriations like Steve did is some of the lists that they would have you work from to make those fundraising calls were literally the people, the entities that the special interests that were asking the appropriations committee for help. I mean, to me, that just it smelled bad. It felt bad. It'd be bad enough if you're cold calling people you don't know, but it's even worse if you're calling people that you know need you for something because that's, that fringes on quid pro quo. In fact, a, a current member on the Republican side uh, said that he thought that was extortion, and it still goes on legally. In fact, I served on the Republican steering committee two separate times. The very first class, the big Gingrich class, we had three representatives on the steering committee because we had 73 freshman Republicans and I was one of them. I was elected by my peers to do that. And then years later, as an appropriator, Steve, I was on the steering committee when Jerry Lewis beat Hal Rogers. And so I know from, I know from being at the table that fundraising prowess and time committed to dial for dollars and raise money for the committees is a factor in promotion in your committee assignments, in your ranking member position or your subcommittee chairmanship and, the full committee, and even Republican leadership elections, they will report how much money you raised, how much money you gave to other candidates, how this hamster wheel that you're on spun quickly. And that's how you advance. That's the real problem today, is this thing has slid so far down the slide, the slippery slope, that uh, it's almost a full-time fundraising chase. If you wanna know, honestly, now, I, I haven't been there for nine years, so I don't know inside out what it's like in the last nine years, and I also don't know what it's like during COVID. And I would even say that COVID, while it's been terrible on many fronts, maybe it helps on some fronts, because maybe COVID has cooled the fundraising chase. I don't know, but I thought about this and I sure hope that it has. I hope that it's caused fundraisers, you know, to not be as commonplace. I don't know how they're raising their money, but I know this, they're motivated first and foremost by staying in office. And that's natural. You can't, you can't criticize them for that, but how it ends up devolving is, is a real conflict because honestly, many days you're in Congress, your first priority is raising money and staying in office instead of serving the people and governing properly. And it ought to be the other way around. And literally they're spending half their time focused on staying in office, raising money and running their campaigns. And I don't think the American people wanted that. Um, the house is particularly worse than the Senate because they only run every six years. The house runs every two years, which means as Steve said, as soon as you get there, the clock starts and then it is a per day challenge to how much can I raise to stay in office. And the average across the country, I mean, he's from New York, so the money's really, really, really big. But even in Tennessee, where I'm from, the goal is to raise a million dollars in a cycle and then try to sit on as much as you can because if you can keep a million dollars, then they're not likely to run a serious challenge against you, which means you're motivated all the time by raising money. And it is like a hamster wheel. When Steve says he doesn't know anybody who likes it, let's just think about that. The members hate it. It is demeaning, degrading, and I'm just telling you, you're elected to a prominent historic role. You are one of 435 in the house. You go there and they make you go over in a little cubicle, give you a sheet to call people from, asking them to attend some dinner with the president or the leadership and you're not asking for the federal congressional campaign limits of $2,700. You may be asking for $10,000 or $25,000 or $50,000. That's called dialing for dollars because the money's going to the committee directly 
limits are different. So it really, as this member said, it flirts with extortion. So it needs to change. Badly, it needs to change. You say, well, why does it not change? Well, I'm part of something with uh, some, some leadership that David Brooks wrote about not long ago called The Great Reset. The goal would be to reset certain norms, values, and expectations following this period of disruption. No matter where you're at politically, this was a period of disruption. Frankly, Sanders is a disruptor. Trump is a disruptor. We had disruptors coming from both sides. The establishment was turned on its head in 16. In a sense, the establishment's still on its head. But then what do we do to pick up the pieces? Well, I'm hoping, and this gets into the solution portion of this, that as we reset standards, norms, expectations, and values, that one of them is the rules of engagement around fundraising. Because if both parties change the rules of engagement and they both agree to the same rules of engagement, neither party is advantaged. So it is much like a nuclear proliferation. It's just both sides think you have to keep going. Oh, oh, and and it's, it's all driven out of fear and paranoia that, oh my God, if we give up any ground, we're gonna lose. You know, and, and the motivations are wrong. The motivation ought to be if we do right by the American people, if we campaign on a set of issues and then we carry it out, they will either elect us or reelect us or not vote for us, depending on what we do, not how much money do you have. And I would even argue, Steve, and interested in your point here, the value of the money raised has gone down grossly because the product of how they reach people through campaigning is so deteriorating. I mean, it's now all negative, mostly. You know, the, the campaign of ads that work are negative. So that's not a positive influence in the American psyche. And two, I don't think the ads are worth a flip. I mean, people don't even know how to spend money. If you give a lot of money now to the committees, as opposed to directly to the candidate, the money does not as effective. And so I just don't think they're doing it right. And I think we need to reset the entire rules of engagement of U.S. campaigns at the federal level. We don't control the state and the local government, but at the federal level, you could actually do this. And I think if either party really wanted to do that, I know that both parties have their agendas, but that'd be a great way to bring the country together following this pandemic, following this time of disruption is, what are the new rules of engagement about how members of Congress spend their time, raise their money and posture themselves for reelection? Kevin. All right, thank you both. And uh, you're, comments that are kind of leading us towards the, the next thing we want to discuss, which is, all right, what are the various ways to skin this cat and which ones, you know, there's the optimal solution, then there's the one that's politically most possible perhaps, or maybe they're one and the same. Um, but I'll start with Steve and let's, let's hear what you think about how do we reform the system. Sure, and I'll, I'll briefly take you through the range of, uh, you know, the most feasible uh, through, to, through the most difficult. Uh, when I mentioned that when I was elected, the rule of thumb was $10,000 a week. And when I chaired DCCC, the rule of thumb was $30,000 a week. What happened in between? So what was the triggering event that created that exponential inflation? And it was a very specific event. It was the Supreme Court's ruling in Citizens United. Yes, some of it was inflated because just media advertising prices went up, the natural inflation of, of buying points on television. Uh, but most of it was when the Supreme Court decided that corporations could put in a, almost an unlimited amount, dark money, not disclose who was paying, and every single incumbent, both Democrat and Republican, at the time realized that if they didn't come up with their million or a million and a half or $2 million in a cycle, that they could be wiped out by a super PAC. And that one event triggered uh, an exponential increase in the time spent fundraising, uh, in the amount of money you invested in a finance operation, uh, and in reaching the goals that you needed to be able to withstand a possible dark money attack from a super PAC. So what's the easiest solution to that? Well, we tried to pass the Disclose Act. The Disclose Act would have simply said uh, that every super PAC is under the same obligation that Zach Womp and Steve Israel were under when we advertised at the end of every ad paid for by our direct campaign dollars. We had to go to camera or speak into a microphone and say, 
I'm Steve Israel, and I approve of this message. I'm Zach Womp, and I approve this message. Remember that, Zach? Well, super PACs don't have the same responsibility, so you don't know who's paying for that ad, who's funding it. Uh, and so the easiest solution is pass that Disclose Act and make a, that transparency a requirement of advertising, just as it is for candidates. Um, there are other mechanisms that would lead to real-time transparency. There were resolutions that would allow for share, corporate shareholder uh, impact or shareholder influence in whether a corporation was spending and donating to super PACs. And ultimately, you end up at public financing. Very difficult to achieve. Uh, some would say impractical. I happen to support it. Uh, I think it's actually going to save money at the end of the day. Uh, but if nothing else, we ought to start with the basic requirement for transparency uh, in passing the Disclose Act and then growing from there. Kevin, you want me to give you some ideas? Absolutely. So I see on the chat line that uh, Michael has asked us about whether the House can do this unilaterally um, or whether... Um, members could be required to uh, disclose the time that they spend raising money, which are theoretically some of the solutions that you could propose. You know, house rules could be changed. Uh, the, the problem that I talked about earlier about using fundraising to determine advancement is actually in the house ethics rules, but to my knowledge, it's never been enforced. And the house ethics rules actually say that you cannot use fundraising stats or prowess for advancement on the steering committee. But I can tell you again, from serving there twice, it is. It, it frankly is a factor and it's a big factor. And that's a, that's a negative thing. Theoretically, the house could change its rules. Um, and, and yes, it would be really cool if you could figure out a way to um, report your time spent fundraising just from a transparency so the public has a right to know. But, you know, a lot of states, including the state I'm in right now, Tennessee, has a state law now that you can't raise money while the legislature is in session. And both parties will tell you it's been very, very, very good in Tennessee. Whereas they used to have a lot of fundraisers at night, they're in session, they're in Nashville, they're, you know, away from their families, they got to spend the night over there, they go to all these events, and the very next day the legislation is pending before them, their committees or their or their, body, their legislative body. And, and that's a direct connection between money and special interest influence. And so they disconnected that. Now, there's some challenges to that because other people can raise money if they're running, but the incumbents can't. So incumbents typically don't like that, but the incumbents have a lot of built-in advantages as well. So I think there's a way you can customize that. It's probably unrealistic to say that members of Congress are ever going to disallow fundraising while they're in Washington because there's a certain amount. I think you could say that while the House is in session, meaning from the time they're gaveled in in the morning to the time they go out at night, you can't have fundraising to try to disconnect it or to limit it because the Constitution comes into play. The Supreme Court's gonna ultimately hear some of these tests on what is and is not permissible, but it's not up to us to prejudge what the Supreme Court's gonna do. It's up to us to establish what's the best policy, what's the most transparent policy. And so I think there's a way to move that way. Now, one thing that I've been advocating since I left Congress, I know, I know the legislative body and I know that in order to get members to do anything that they might feel hurts them collectively, you gotta give them something in return. And for a long time, Kevin, you're a policy guy, Republican or Democrat, one of the craziest things about Washington and serving in Congress is, I think it's probably the only legislative body in the country that gets no per diem for housing, yet housing in DC is extremely expensive. So your salary is okay, even though it's been flatlined at like $172,000 for like 15 years, I don't know, 20 years, but they don't get a per diem, yet they've got very expensive housing. And probably 150 out of 435 members of Congress live in their offices at night and take a shower in the house gym, which is really kind of crazy. But it's more and more and more because it's free. And so instead of paying $2,000 a month for an apartment, which is probably average, that's what a lot of them do. More and more of them do. And there's something that just doesn't ring true about that either, that some of them get to live free and some of them don't. So what if you said, we're going to tie a reform package together where we're going to install a per diem, which is actually an honorable way 
to compensate the real cost, the actual cost that members of Congress has, and we're gonna limit, while you're in Washington, the amount of time you can spend raising money. Guess who would applaud that change together first? Members. Members would say, wow, we need both of these things. Please limit the time that I have to be on that hamster wheel raising money while I'm in session so that I can make laws and so I can legislate and so I can meet with my peers and attend committee meetings. I mean, literally there are people that go over there and dial for dollars instead of going to the committee meetings they're supposed to go to because they know they're gonna advance if they go raise money, not necessarily gonna advance if you attend your committee meeting. That's a perverted system. So somehow we've got to have a carrot and a stick and bring the Congress to a place of saying, hey, that reform package has a chance of passing. And I believe if you coupled some of these things together, you could move these reforms forward and really restore confidence that the American people deserve to have in Congress and make Congress work better. Yeah, didn't uh, Representative David Jolly have a bill yeah. on that, or, which would basically yeah. ban call time when the House was in session a few years David, ago? David did have that bill. Uh, the there was a little bit of a loophole in it, uh, which, which allowed staff to make calls uh, while Congress was in session, I believe. And and to me, that was just uh, you know shifting the problem uh, to to staff. Yeah, and um, I guess really basic question about the call time. I mean, in your experience, is call time something that is doable when a member is at home? I mean, instead of having you being pulled off the hill to go to these cubicles, like if you're not in session Monday or if you're not in session Friday, why not do those calls from home? Like make those the days of fundraising days and leave Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Because it's yeah. to work. Well, Kevin, it's a math problem. If you've got to raise thirty thousand dollars a week, mm -hmm. Monday and Friday isn't going to cut it, right? Yeah. So that means you got you got to put thirty hours a week in. Uh, and when you're home, as Zach knows, you do have public responsibilities to your constituents. You're doing events at home. And so the only way to help ensure that you're reaching that $30,000 a week, 30 hours a week, is to make sure that you're doing five hours a day, five days a week, or actually more than that, six, seven hours a day. Uh, and, but again, I, wanna, I just want to say one other thing. I want to reiterate, not every member of Congress is on that regimen. Mm -hmm. uh, it is those members of Congress who have, who are in those high price media markets, who have competitive races, or, and I think Zach would agree with this, members who are on a leadership track that need a lot of money to give away to other members, yeah. uh, transfer, uh, and, and want to be able to build those relationships. They, those members on leadership tracks do put in that time uh, in order to raise the funds to ingratiate themselves with uh, many of their colleagues. Yeah, go, you want to go ahead, Zach? Well, the, that leadership track is also, I think, the dangerous track because the average rank and file member is not going to be so motivated by the money. You know, even the scripture says it's the love of money, basically the lust of money that's the sin, not money itself. So if you just really get addicted to this hamster wheel of I'm going to raise so much money that I want to be in leadership, that's a corrupting influence because there's no telling where you will stop. But the average rank and file member is just trying to raise enough money to stay in office. And so you got to set up some reasonable boundaries and frankly respect the position. Um, this is a two-sided coin here. There's, there should be more expected out of our leadership, our congressmen and women, and we should expect more out of the people. Uh, we, we don't have an electorate anymore that cares enough. Uh, I hate to, hate to be critical, but we don't have enough people voting. We don't have enough, even though we've had good participation, we don't have enough people engaging in the, in the process and the issues, even though we've seen protest and activity. I'm just saying that this system is required to have responsible citizens. And so it's, it's a two-sided deal. So let, let's hold up the members of Congress a little higher and then let's expect them to act a little better and, and both at the same time. And I think you'll get a better product. Um, but what else? Well, I wanted to just drill down a little bit more on the money and where it's coming from. And I'm curious in your experiences, uh, was more of it coming from wealthy individuals or was it coming from corporations uh, or somewhere else? when you were doing the call time and having to show up and 
you know, eat the fish tacos and, uh, you know, the crab cakes and all those sort of fundraising things. I'll go first. If, if it's your home state fundraising, it's individuals. If it's DC fundraising, it's those corporations and special interest. It's just almost that simple. That's why you've seen even some strong Republicans and a real prominent Republican Senator has been speaking out lately saying we should limit fundraising for Congress to the home state, not even the congressional district, the home state of the candidate or the incumbent so that no money from outside the state determines who raises the most money. And that disconnects a lot of the DC special interest. A lot of that appropriations committee phone calling were those special interests that are, in some cases, they're the lobbyists for the companies. In some cases, it's the government relations person embedded in the company. In some cases, it's the person who used to work on the Hill that's now their government relations vice president, so you know them. And so it gets really sticky, and it, and it becomes kind of the, it's what the president calls the swamp. And, and what Democrats call, the, you know, special interest, kind of K Street special interest, it, it's out of whack, um, and you're never going to eliminate, you know, the whole lobbying in, empire, understand, lobbying is the world's second oldest profession, and we know what the first is, and constitutionally, you're never going to eliminate it. So what, what do you do? You try to carve it up so that lobbyists can't bundle checks and can't be real involved in the process. They can only do their job lobbying. We even, issue one, advocates legislation where you can choose uh, that you're either lobbying a congressman or you're giving to them, but you can't do both. If you're a registered lobbyist, you can either contribute to that person and not lobby, or you can lobby for them and not contribute, but you can't do both, which is one way to develop some kind of line. So this is a complex thing, and the Supreme Court's involved in this money issue, and we haven't talked at all about Citizens United, but my gosh, this compounded Steve's problem and my problem tenfold with Citizens United because if a member of Congress is not going to lose control, Senate or House, of the message in their own campaign, they're competing because of Citizens United with these outside interests that are going to drown them out. So you lose control of your own, your own message unless you raise X dollars. And if you have to raise a million two in a cycle to get your message across in my congressional district, that's a, that's a full-time hamster turn, you know, on the hamster wheel. Uh, and it's a lot of it was made a lot worse because these outside interests have so much money and you have no idea where it's coming from. The example I give on this was in Tennessee in 18, Marsha Blackburn ran against Phil Bredesen. He was our former Democratic governor, well-heeled person. Uh, almost a hundred million dollars was raised, but uh, like a third of it was raised by the candidates themselves. Two thirds of all spending were outside of Tennessee interest, buying up the airwaves in Tennessee. So the candidates themselves had very little influence in what ended up happening. And to me, that's a sad outcome of money in politics. Kevin, let me let me go back to to the question of uh, of how you divide your, your resources and your fundraising. It, it depends entirely uh, on who's raising the money, uh, from whom, and where. So, for example, if you're a committee chair, a ranking member, a disproportionate share of your fundraising revenues will come from PACs uh, and industry groups that uh, are relevant to your jurisdiction. If you're AOC a disproportionate share of your revenues are coming from grassroots online donations. So it really does fluctuate. There was a rule of thumb earlier that about a third of your revenues should come from the PAC community, a third from donors, a third from everything else. Digital fundraising has changed that formula. And so now it's, it's really been accentuated. So the, the good news here, actually, the silver lining is digital fundraising has now become much more important and digital fundraising tends to be small dollars. You all know because you get 50 emails a day from candidates asking you to press $3, right, $5. That has, has taken up a much larger share of the fundraising space, not the PACs, not uh, maxers and double maxers, but those digital donors. And so as technology changes, so does the formula for raising those funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, you, that actually anticipated one of the questions we got from uh, Davika Daga, who said, do you think there's an opportunity for members to be more innovative in how they raise money 
for example, by tapping into grassroots support and using the internet for fundraising, perhaps in a larger kind of effort to democratize the support, because it never looks so great when most of the money is coming from just a few big players, particularly DC insiders. It is leveling the playing field. I'll, I'll just say that. Definitely leveling the playing field. But we still got a long way to go before all the planes are on one in one spot. Zach? Well, and COVID creates this moment where a lot of things are being recalibrated. Uh, behind me, through that window out there, there is a $340 million complex for a major health insurance company. And they just announced after three months of their people working from home, that over 90% of their workers are not coming back to work. They're going to work from home. Kevin, I've seen everything you've written about whether Congress can work from home or work electronically, what the constitutional challenges are. We are resetting a lot of things by necessity now because of COVID. This whole question needs to be part of it. Uh, the questioner is, is spot on. This is the moment where we say, what are the better ways to campaign? What are the better rules to set? One of your questioners asked, you know, isn't it better to limit campaign limits than to limit the time that people can actually raise money? The Supreme Court determines campaign limits. You can set them until you're blue in the face, but if the Supreme Court throws them out, then it doesn't matter what you do. And, and they've done that over and over again. The Supreme Court has said you can't establish unreasonable limits. There are some limits to campaign fundraising, but you know, we, we have to deal with that. So in the meantime, limiting by some kind of an agreement how much time you're spending raising money, just think about this for a minute, Kevin. What if the slippery slope that I talk about devolves such that COVID is still bad a year from now, Congress is not meeting in person very much, we start doing legislation sort of on autopilot like we did with continuing resolutions and everything just exists on pre-existing law and Congress is not doing much of a job in a year from now because COVID keeps them from doing their job and all they're doing is fundraising. And so all that they have to do is raise enough money. Is that what we want? And the answer is not no, it's hell no. <laughs> hell no. This is the moment where we regroup, reset, reevaluate, put new plans in motion, look for new ways to campaign, new rules of engagement. This is when you do it. You do it at time of crisis. Well, wait a second. We weren't doing that very well. I just talked about in 30 years how this whole process has slid down to where people have no confidence in it. Then Citizens United happened and it's like, holy smoke. I'll never forget. I did a press event with Senator Fred Thompson after Citizens United passed. And he said, the late Fred Thompson, that as of today, People running for the United States House, the United States Senate, will potentially lose all control of their own campaigns. So these things have happened. Now, now, what do we do from here? How do we reevaluate? The answer is yes. There's a better way to do it than what we're doing today. Is it hard? Is it complicated? Yes. But this whole COVID thing ought to force us to recalibrate how we spend our time and what our expectations are. Yeah. Some anecdotal. Um evidence I've heard is that uh, members right now are not spending as much time fundraising and they're spending a lot more time in their home districts um, doing constituent service and helping translate and oversee individual issues in terms of getting, you know, PPP checks and, and that sort of thing. Um, I guess it prompts the question then, if, if individual members can, by necessity, reduce the amount of time they're spending now because they've all collectively had to do it. Is that work going to flow over onto somebody else to raise that money? And is that also a possible path forward? Like why rely so heavily on 435 members of the house who have other stuff to do if somebody else can do it for them? Well, look, to a degree. It is accurate uh, to say that members are raising less uh, for several reasons. Number one, uh, members were sensitive on both sides of the aisle were sensitive uh, to uh, the, uh, the optics of having fundraisers in the middle of one of the greatest crises that we have experienced in many decades. I remember uh, a slew of fundraising events uh, were canceled, not only because you couldn't get into the same room with members, 
but simply because it just it stunk to be to, to be out there raising money during this. So part of it was strategic. Secondly, um, every crisis is an opportunity for members uh, to reconnect with their district, and so they are properly not only as a matter of governing, but as a matter of politics, they have become uh, super const constituent caseworkers. They have devoted themselves to being problem solvers, uh, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. Meanwhile, their finance staffs, and every member has to have a finance infrastructure, they are figuring out how to go about re uh, reaching the goal that will be necessary. So what we're seeing is a moment in time, um, but it will adapt to circumstances. My guess is when uh, most members believe that politically fundraising does not look as bad as uh, it may have. And when health situations allow for fundraisers again and, you know, dipping your fingers into the same platter of soggy egg rolls, they're going to go back to that. When the congressional schedule resumes and every night is a potential PAC event or two or three, they're going to go back to that. Uh, and they're, but they are, look, fundraising is, is very adaptable. Right? When you have a problem with fundraising, you find ways to adapt to solve um, that problem. Mm -hmm. So earlier referenced the, the point that uh, as a member of Congress, you want to be able to control your own message and the larger narrative around you. And that's where you are, feel this incentive to kind of keep raising more money because you don't want to get bean by somebody dumping a bunch of ads on you, uh, portraying you in an unfavorable light. Um, Anthony Lamarena asked a question saying, uh, do you think that by limiting how much each side can raise and spend in campaigns and only shift powers to news outlets, um, who will therefore have a stronger ability to affect the narrative? And that just gets to the larger kind of strategic challenge of the individual member. Like, how do we make this advantageous for you without making it uh, ultimately decrease your perception of what your odds of getting reelected are? Yeah, I don't want to be too uh, negative, but cable news is a misnomer. It's now cable propaganda, and they are extremely influential. And it doesn't matter how much you limit members of Congress's time of raising money, they are too influential. They still are too influential. They're going to be too influential. You're not going to diminish their influence. There's, there's almost a social responsibility that needs to be connected to what they're doing now because the propaganda machines – are not news anymore. I mean, when I say saturate yourself in good, honest information, I hate to say it, but you're probably not going to get it from cable news on either side because they're in the propaganda, advertising-driven revenue stream mode as opposed to reporting accurate news. And that puts Congress kind of behind the eight ball because they're not going to get reported on properly anyway. One of the greatest things that happened was the uh, bipartisan select committee on the modernization of Congress in the last two years. They couldn't get any attention because it's not cable newsworthy because it's not controversial. It's actually members of Congress coming together and doing something good. So does it get reported on? No, it doesn't. One thing I would tell you that we did is called Swamp Stories and my son's podcast series runs. I think Steve, you've got some podcasts you might want to advertise too, but issue one has Swamp Stories Bill Gray was involved in setting them up. They evaluate some of these issues of, of what's wrong in the swamp and how to fix it. And they've done 12 of these every week or so. One of these comes out to evaluate these problems. One of the questions also that came in on the chat site is can leadership PAC contributions also be corrupting? And let me just say the very author of leadership PACs, um, what was his name from California? Who, Weston? Who? Oh, yeah. Uh, was it David? O not David Ovi. Henry, Henry Waxman. Henry Waxman, yes. He had no idea that leadership packs would evolve the way they've evolved because today there's one little loophole in the leadership pack uh, regulation. It wasn't even a statute. Regulation from the FEC that doesn't exclude personal use doesn't it allows personal use of the money and so literally if you have a congressional campaign account as jesse jackson jr did and you use that or duncan hunter to give both sides use that campaign fund for personal use flying a rabbit across the country or buying a rolex watch it violates federal law and you end up serving time in both cases that those things happen 
But if you did the exact same thing out of a leadership pack, because there's no regulation prohibiting personal use of those campaign funds, it's not against the law. Is it unethical? Yes. Is it against the law? No. Can you serve time for it? No. We need to clean up some of these things. There needs to be a personal use prohibition in leadership packs so that you can't take your eight buddies from high school to Bandon Dunes to play golf for a week and pay for it out of a campaign fund. Today, you can legally do that. They don't even have to be donors because there's no personal use prohibition. So yes, leadership packs can be corrupting. Frankly, everything in politics can be corrupting if you use it the wrong way. We need bright lines, transparency, and better sets of rules. We need to know how to go back and clean stuff up because unintended consequences have set in. Hey, Kevin, can I, can I just pick up on, on something? Yes. Would you mind? You know, we've been talking about the, the ground level of, uh, of campaign financing and fundraising in politics, but I think we ought to, to raise it uh, to a much higher level and, and consider the, the environment that we're in, the political environment that, as, as uh, Zach said at the outset, uh, gave us Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, two disruptors. We did a ton of research at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee on what was happening to voters across the country. Why were they turning against both parties uh, to a, a, you know, some alternative? Uh, and one of the things we found, and this is something that, we re that really keeps me up at night, uh, is that we're in this, this convergent moment where you know, most Americans have lost faith in institutions, whether it's scandals in sports, or scandals in religion, or scandals on Wall Street, or scandals in, in uh, political uh, institutions. They uh, have lost faith in democracy. They don't believe that you're going to be heard unless you have a, a K Street lobbying firm and a super PAC. Uh, and they've lost, they, they think that the notion of even voting is almost comical. Like why vote? I, I, I don't, I'm not going to impact anything. This is very dangerous when you have a uh, critical mass of Americans who've essentially given up on democracy because of the influence of money, because they see uh, the erosion of institutions, and oh, by the way, to Zach's point, because they are curating their own news. So, you know, you go on CNN, you have an opinion. I go on MSNBC frequently, I haven't since COVID started, uh, but I know when I'm talking on MSNBC, I know who my audience is, and it, it, I don't know whether Zach does Fox, but he knows who his audience is in Fox. We're curating our news. We're in gerrymandered congressional districts that are either red or blue, uh, and, we, and because of money, we have largely lost faith in democracy. For both political parties, nothing could be more dangerous. And so I would argue that we need to fix fundraising as a first step in restoring public faith in America's government and its ability, its ability to govern and its politics. Yeah, let me, let me piggyback on that, Kevin, if I could, because I wanna to speak to Republicans for a minute. If we don't clean up our current system of campaign finance and help to restore some confidence, the default position on down the road is public financing. If you don't want public financing, you better get off the couch and get engaged in trying to clean up this current system because where are we heading? One of your questioners asked, is it a black, is it a, is it a dry hole to try to a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United? Let me just say it's extremely difficult and you can't turn the Supreme Court around in any kind of short period of time either. So this is current law. It is current rules. And it's going to be that way for the foreseeable future. If we don't improve the things we're talking about today, the default on a system that's completely broken down is going to be public financing. It's kind of like the old thing I used to say when I was in Congress is if you don't want national health care, you better fix our fee for service health care system because it's not working very well. The default is national health care. Default here is public financing. I happen to be a Republican who always stood back from, I don't want to say opposed because I never really trashed it. I didn't want public financing. I like people to give individually to candidates. I even encourage people put the check in the candidate's hand, tell them what you expect and that's good government. Then they either do it or not. Eliminate as much of the special interest as you can under the constitution. The Supreme Court validates it. 
but that's the way I like to do it. But I'm telling you, it's now such a screwed up system that the default is going to be public financing. The only way you're going to end up ever levelizing this because the special interest dominates today is public financing. I don't want it, but if we do nothing, it's coming. So we're down to about five minutes left. And uh, so I'm going to move into a little bit of a speed round. I'm going to put two audience questions out there and either of you can jump on either one of them. Uh, we got Adam Fortier Brown asking regarding fundraising and media would reauthorizing the FCC fairness doctrine requiring broadcasters to present issues of public importance in honest, equitable and balanced ways be part of the equation. Um, and secondly, um, in terms of the money, we're talking a lot about the money, but who controls the money when it comes in? Is it members of Congress sitting there with their little checkbooks and tabulating, or is it going somewhere else? And who's overseeing where it gets spent? I'll do that real brief, and then I'll go to Zach. Uh, absolutely. Restoring both the fair, Fairness Doctrine and Equal Time is an important part of, of this equation, uh, and it, it does help uh, break down the silos that are in our current uh, media uh, infrastructure. Uh, and in terms of who decides where the money is going to be uh, spent, you know, the finance director raises it, as Zach knows, the campaign manager decides how to spend it. And very often, you know, it's like the candidates do the grunt work raising the money, but uh, at least in my case, I had very little say on how it was used. Well, and you were chairman of the DCCC and you know how it's organized. And I, and I don't want to, uh, again, be too negative towards either committee, but outside looking in and participating, and I served on the executive committee a couple of times of the, the NRCC, the most effective campaign investments in the country are a direct individual check under the federal limits given directly to the candidate in the form of a check, as I said, and asking to hold them accountable. The campaigns themselves are relatively efficient. Uh, my son's in the other room and he ran for Congress and ran a really, really efficient campaign using all the modern technologies of online fundraising and uh, internet communication and social media buying, et cetera, et cetera. That's an efficient operation. I don't believe that either congressional committee or either senatorial committee are efficient organizations. I think very little of the money that you give to them actually makes their way to the candidates and the campaigns. There's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of waste. And so when somebody asks, where does the money go? I, I frankly think there's not enough transparency in where the money goes once it gets to Washington. Steve, do you agree with that? Yeah, I was talking about the individual committees, yes. uh, the you know specific candidate committees. Uh, at the level of DTRIP and NRCC, uh, essentially the chair chairperson uh, decides how much money to put into advertising and then decides who, what to allocate where uh, and then decisions are made on what what uh, how many points to buy what kind of media is going to be employed but on a, a individual basis I mean maybe you were more um, uh, disciplined than I was I would just say you know what's our budget budget is two and a half million all right just spend it the way you need to spend it in order for us to win okay uh, last question I'll ask before we wrap things up is we have seen recently some high profile instances within Congress where members are cognizant that there are television cameras and media there and who are playing to them while simultaneously have an operation outside fundraising on those moments you know, instantly creating YouTube moments and Twitter moments and those sorts of stuff and pack and those things are getting packaged with fundraising pitches. When you both were in Congress, were you noticing that sort of thing happening where representatives were kind of playing it up because they were playing it up, not for the constituents, but for the interests? Of course. In fact, uh, real early on when, when you get there, the blowhards and the noisemakers are separated real quick from the serious legislators and lawmakers. And that's been going on a long time. There's been blowhards. It's kind of like, is the Congress more, uh, you know, uh, full of hate than it's ever been? Well, actually, no, people in Tennessee used to hit each other with canes. I mean, there's been all kind of congressional malfeasance throughout history. And there have been people that have said crazy things and done crazy things. 
that's not as much the problem as we've actually let our guard down on what are, what's good, what are good rules, what are good boundaries, what are good expectations, and we've let the money machine take over the lawmaking. Should that be our last comment or do you have one more, Steve? Well, I, I, I do, and uh, I guess it's a good way to wrap up. There's this um, sense because of the media and the sensationalism that Congress is a place where uh, people are constantly taking those canes to one another, that there is no bipartisan accord, that Republicans have their team, Democrats have their team, nobody's meeting in the middle anymore. Uh, I, I want to dispute that, that notion, actually, uh, and then I'll relate it to, to fundraising. Um, you see, it's like a, Congress is like, a, it's like an ocean storm. So you see the frothing, right, and the energy at the surface, but underneath it's more tranquil. My experience is if you can get Zach Womp and Steve Israel uh, together on the balcony outside the, uh, outside the House of Representatives, um, you could find a cord. There are mem members of Congress don't want to go to Washington to fight. Maybe the blowhard caucus does, but the rest are pretty normal people and they just go because they really believe in public service and want to get things done. What we need is an organizing principle, the kind that Zach is fighting for, that will get those members on both sides of the aisle to some common ground on fundraising and on finance reform. And if they do that, I believe that American, America's voters will find more faith in the process, the institution, the Congress, and their individual member of Congress. For me, nothing could be more important. You solve that one problem, you're going to solve a whole bunch of pro other problems down the line. Well said. Well, all right. Honorable Steve Israel, Honorable Zach Wump, thank you both for sharing your valuable time with us today. Thanks. And I want to thank the 50-some members of the audience that we had here on Listening In. And I want to let you know that we are capturing a video of this event, which we will be posting uh, later this week on ledgebranch.org. So for those of you who didn't make it uh, or had to step out during the course of the conversation, you can watch it again. So with that, thank you all and have a terrific day. Thank you. See you, Zach. Thank you, sir. You too.